Good morning, everyone. Nice to see the sunshine, isn't it? What a week this was. Mm. Glad you're all here and we're worshiping together as well as those that are with us on Zoom. Uh, we'll begin our worship service with our prelude. Dear friends, let us love one another because love comes from God, and whoever loves others is a child of God. God has shown us what is good, to do justice, to love with kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. Our first hymn this morning is, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Thank you. 
the Lord in prayer. And he find a friend so faithful, who will all our sorrows share. He does know our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. God is with us, Christ is with us, and their Holy Spirit is with us. Let us pray. O eternal God, companion of us all who seek you, draw near to us so that we may draw near to you. Grant us the grace to love others as you love them. Enable us to serve you according to your will. Grant us the true freedom which is found only in Jesus Christ our Lord. We have been so often carried away by our awareness of those around us that we've forgotten to remember the possibility of eternal life rests solely in your hands, O Lord, and that you've called us not to live by the standards of this world, but solely by those that you have established. Forgive us, Lord, and help us to have the strength and courage to stand firmly on our faith in you and live each day according to your will alone, Lord Jesus. In your name alone do we pray this. Amen. Since we are justified by faith alone, in that faith we can find peace with God and forgiveness of all our sins. Through Jesus Christ alone do we find the grace, hope, and joy that comes from sharing with others the glory of God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he arose again and ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
The epistle reading this morning is from the 17th chapter of Genesis, verses 1 through 7, and then 15 through 16, from the Living Bible paraphrased. When Abram was 99 years old, God appeared to him and told him, I am the Almighty God. Obey me and live as I direct you. I will prepare a contract between us, guaranteeing to make you a mighty nation. You shall be the father of not just one nation, but a multitude of nations. Abram fell flat on his face in the dust as God talked with him. What's more, God said to him, I am changing your name. You will no longer be Abram, exalted father, but Abraham, father of many nations. For that is what you will be. I will give you millions of descendants. You will form many nations. Kings shall be among your descendants, and I will continue this agreement between us from generation to generation forever, it is, for it is between me and your children as well. I shall be your God and the God of your posterity, and I will give the land of Canaan to you and to them forever. Then God <laughs> added, regarding, regarding Sarai, your wife, her name is no longer Sarai, but Sarah, which means princess. And I will bless her and give you a son through her. I will bless her richly and make her the mother of many nations. Many kings shall be among your posterity. May God add his blessing here in his holy word this morning. Amen. We're now going to sing the psalm, which is in your uh, uh, pews. Uh, Joe is going to sing the refrain first time. And then we'll sing the refrain with him a second time. And then Joe will sing a verse and we'll sing the refrain for the rest of the song. <laughs>
Our hymn is, In Cross of Christ I Glory. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the gospel according to St. Mark, beginning with the ninth verse of the first chapter and reading through verse 15. One day Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the river Jordan. When Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the heavens open before him and the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove descending upon him. And a voice from heaven said, you are my beloved son in whom I delight. Immediately, the Holy Spirit led Jesus out into the desert, into the wilderness. There, for 40 days, he was subjected to Satan's and temptations to sin, and afterward, the angels came and cared for him. Following John's arrest by King Herod, Jesus went back to Galilee to preach God's good news, the gospel. At last, the time has come, Jesus said. King, God's kingdom has drawn near. Turn from your sins and act on this glorious good news. May the Lord bless his reading of his Holy Spirit this morning, Holy Scripture this morning, and may it become truth for us yet this very day. There's an equation in front of us. There's 40 days that Jesus was in the wilderness, and we're starting the 40 days of Lent. How do those two things relate to each other? Now, first of all, we know that Jesus didn't spend the 40 days in the wilderness wearing ashes or uh, going to specific worship services or anything along that line. He was led by the Holy Spirit out into the wilderness, out where there were no other human beings, out where there was very few resources for him. For instance, 
one of his great concerns would have been any wild animals. His second great concern would be, what was he going to eat? And the third great uh, thing that he wrestled with physically was, where was he going to get water? Because we all know that human beings can go for quite some time without food, but not very long without water. Now, it says in the scripture that Jesus was led out there by the Holy Ghost, by the Spirit of God, by the Spirit of both of them. And I always wonder, we, we were in uh, Israel, and I remember the bus trip down from Jerusalem, down to Jericho, and how there was wilderness on both sides, and every once in a while you might see a, a shepherd with some sheep off on a valley someplace, but there really wasn't a lot of trees or anything. So if he went south of Jericho, which is probably the area where John was baptizing, he would have been really exposed to a lot of different elements that could have done him great damage. The sun, for instance. I mean, he didn't have an RV with him or a tent, so he couldn't hide anywhere. So this was an agony, agonizing experience for, for Jesus. If, however, he'd gone to the north of Jericho into where there were more trees and stuff like that, there were areas that were not populated where he could have been alone and yet still have to worry about where he was going to get water, where he was going to get food, and what about the wild animals and the storms that could happen. So those 40 days were really double whammy for Jesus. Not only... Physically, was he being challenged by being in the wilderness? But without any other human contact, his mind was spinning. And we know from what the scriptures say, the devil was right there helping that mind spin faster and faster with all kinds of possibilities that he could do what the devil was asking him to do rather than what God was asking him to do. Something took place when Jesus was baptized. First of all, he didn't need it. He, he had no sins that he had to be forgiven of. And so John must have really looked at him like, what, what are you doing here and why do you want me to baptize you? In fact, one of the scriptures say that and Jesus says, it's all right. That's what God wants. Okay. So he's baptized. He has started a new part of his life spiritually as well as living-wise. He was no longer going to earn a living being a carpenter like his father. Now he was going to survive as a teacher and preacher. And this time of temptation was him circling in ever closer to what that was supposed to be. But the devil was working at him. He was throwing up all kinds of things, not only physical, but mentally. You know, if you will worship me, I will give you all the kingdoms of the world, which God had already promised Abraham. <laughs> yeah. So the devil's wrestling with him. The devil's trying to get him to step away from the plan that God has for him and us all. What would have happened if Jesus had succumbed to temptation, where would we be? Where would he have been? What would have happened to God's plan of how to forgive our sins through Jesus' death and resurrection? Whoa. So this was vital. This was important. This was a very, very important initial step that Jesus had to take to be fully prepared to lead and guide not only his disciples, but all those that he met, spoke with, healed, and preached to, and taught. He had to make the right choices. Now, one of the disciples, or one of the uh, gospels end this way. After he'd been tempted with everything that Satan was doing, and he had successfully rejected everything Satan was trying to get him to do. It says that Satan left him alone. 
for a while. <laughs> I mean, come on. Until Jesus rose from the grave, the devil was always still trying to sidetrack, to derail the ministry of Jesus. Okay, so that's the 40 days of Jesus. What about the 40 days of us? What are we doing in Lent? What are we struggling with? Many of us begin with a traditional Ash Wednesday service, have the imposition of ashes, or talk about ashes, or look at how we have to get rid of all the sins and things that are messing with our lives before we can really begin to work through Lent. Well, what we need to do in Lent is basically the same thing Jesus did. Talk with the Father. Wrestle with the devil. Be supported by the angels. But we have to do some things in order to do that. Number one, we have to step away from our daily lives as the world wrestles along. Many of us have things like the upper room that you take and you read a passage each day, you look at a, a scripture lesson, you listen to a pastoral a daily message, whatever it is, you take and you step back from your daily rush and spend a few minutes with God. Other people take the time to pray each morning at the same time. Very important, and they pray to the Father, and they wrestle with what God wants them to do and how they're going to respond and, and what's in their way and how they're going to get around whatever those impediments are. Other people will take a time each day to read the Scriptures and let the Holy Spirit work through those words. As we look at the study of those passages and those things that transpired. But whatever that is, we have to step away from our daily life at least for a time every day. Because that's the only way we're going to be in God's presence in a way in which he can talk to us. We have to get our ears ready to hear. Now, if all we do is get up in the morning and rushing off and then think, yeah. but there's another way. There's a way at the end of the day to take the same kind of time to say, okay, Lord, I've been through all of this this day, all this mess. Show me how I should learn from that. What should I learn from what took place today? Where could I have been improved? Where could I have done a better job for you? Where could I have loved that I missed? And so it's just as important if you're not doing it the first thing in the morning, before you go to bed at night, look at where God's been in your life that day and how you're going to interact with those around you in his name, with his love. So we can make the 40 days of preparation called Lent similar to what Jesus went through in preparing for his ministry. Notice that the end of what Mark wrote was that when John was arrested, that is, he was taken out of the public ministry. He had done his job. He had introduced Jesus to the world. He had shown baptism as the way to come to God. He had done his work, and now he was being taken off of the scene. Then and only then did Jesus begin his public ministry. He wasn't in competition with his cousin. He was preparation, and now I need to go to work. That's the way we need to make Lent become. As a time of preparation, a time of searching ourselves and what is God trying to say to us. And we cannot hear him if all we're doing is rushing through life, trying to get to whatever the next thing is we have to do. Now, in the next week of Lent, sermon-wise, I'm going to be talking about several of the great passages of time with Jesus' ministry as to what his overcoming the temptation 
in the wilderness provided him with able to help others, to teach others that they could love one another, to show that, to demonstrate that. That all came from struggling through it and setting his priorities and being assured that he was aligned with God's will. Then he moved out. That's what we need to do as well. So we need to hear what was Jesus saying to us in those messages, in those experiences. And that's what we're going to be spending the rest of our time during Lent. May God bless us all. Amen. What are the prayer concerns of our church this morning? Yeah? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Dan? Yeah. Such a recovery period of time, too, it's going to take to, for those of, across the South, not just Texas, but they're the, the worst off. 
you know. I, I, the, the part of that whole thing that I don't understand is how, when the electricity is in such bad shape, you then can charge a customer $15,000. <laughs> what? <laughs> You're trying to make up for your mistake? I, I, that, you know, anyways. <laughs> Any others? Yes. That was the one who died down there? I, I, I couldn't hear you really, Elaine. Oh, they, great difficulty with the, even though they had a fireplace. Yeah. Okay, Butch? Okay, Lindsay, Molly, and Devin in the Devin. confirmation. Devin. 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 Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, who are in the confirmation class and wrestling with what does it mean to be a church member and a Christian? Any others? So we go before God in prayer. Gracious God, you call us into your presence to speak with you, to share with you what is on our hearts and minds, what is troubling our spirit. So as we approach you and receive that eternal welcome of open arms and invitation to be embraced by you, we offer up these concerns that we've stated the surgery, the struggles that have been going on in the South, those that are wrestling with individual situations there, a confirmation class, so many other situations of our church life and the world around us that we interact with and we need your help, guidance, direction of how to love others that sometimes are difficult to love. And yet you love them, even if they reject you, you still love them. And so we struggle hard to follow in your footsteps and do the same. We seek to be those men and women of Christ that help others, that improve the life of the world around us. We ask that as our churches in this world wrestle with the pandemic and how to minister unto people, you continue to show us new ways to interact with one another as you already have. Not only technologically, but behind the technology to express and share and receive the love that we have for one another. Even if we're having difficulties with someone, may our reaching out help them and lead them to what you want for their lives. We also ask for our nation beyond just weather and the pandemic, the struggle to be the best that we all can be, to once again be the leader of the free world, to demonstrate what it means to be free and yet united voluntarily one with another. And as your church moves out into the world, as it encircles this globe, we ask that your Holy Spirit lead, guide, and direct us all. This we pray in the name of him who taught us to pray with these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm sorry, Joe. We were supposed to sing that, weren't we? We'll do it next week. Okay. We'll do that next <laughs> week. Ah. Um, the announcements. Um, we're looking at doing the... Um, I've been looking at the Seder meal, uh, beginning with my pastoral thoughts for the day, and I'll continue to do that for the rest of uh, Lent, uh, dissecting it, trying to understand what it means not only to our Jewish brothers and sisters, but also to us. How did it uh, lead, guide, and direct us into having the Holy Communion that Jesus uh, had with his um, disciples in that upper room, and how we now celebrate that same uh, meal of uh, love and uh, faithfulness. Um, so, are there other announcements we need to make this morning? If not, let our closing hymn be on Jordan's Bank, and we're going to sing the first four verses, number 156. Share his love with those you meet today and in the days to come. Go now in his peace. Amen. Amen.